Okay, so that's, you might say, on the Pinchas side. But then in this Torah portion, uh, we have the daughters of Tzolofachad who give us the exact other point of view, right? Let's read re- briefly who they are. Uh, as Yeshaya said, five daughters come up and say, we don't think the Torah is fair. This law of inheritance only going to sons, okay? So uh, taken to Moses, and what does Moses say? Does he say, God gave us a perfect Torah? If you go to your local Asher Chabad rabbi, God gave us a perfect Torah, you know, 613 commandments, right? Don't take one out. Don't put one in. It's all perfect. What did Moshe say? You have a point. Maybe the Torah is not perfect. Okay. This is Moshe. Maybe the Torah is not perfect. He goes to God. God says, you know what? God says to Moses, you're right. I mean, they're right. I forgot about that. <laughs> it's like, it's like yeah, that's one of those tablets I, you left on Mount Sinai. Let me give it to you now. He goes, all right, so let's, we're going we're gonna to change the law up. I mean, look at the daughter of Tzolofachad. I got to tell you, Reformed rabbinical students love it when they actually, you know, they take a little bit of Reformed Judaism law and they come to this, oh, here it is, Reformed Judaism. Not exactly, uh, but kind of close. The idea of, we actually don't know what's in God's mind. And the text does not contain all of God's knowledge. So if anybody says all of God's knowledge has been poured into the text, right, that's just profoundly not true. How do we know? Daughters of Tulofachat. So they say, yeah, we know your whole Torah and there's something missing. And God says, that's right. There's something missing. And thank you for bringing that up. Meaning, how do we complete the Torah? By showing where, where it's lacking. God would not have noticed for all of God's omniscience, it didn't occur to God. So for God to act as a complete God's self, for God to complete God's law, you might say the divine needs human beings to say, there's something missing here. So you might say Torah comes from the conversation, and this is something that I believe very deeply, Torah comes from the conversation between God and the, uh, uh, the people of Israel. So for me, one of the most beautiful lines in this Torah portion that has Pinchas getting the Brit Shalom Award, I think, remember, from the view of the editors of the Bible, we wish we, you would have stamped out this for addition to fertility, fertility cults back then, um, and the daughter of Tzolofachad, which means civil thoughtful process brings out divine law. They didn't accuse, they didn't defame, they didn't attack. They said, we have a thought, can we share it with you? That's how they got there. Now, who's the opposite of the daughters of Tzolofachad in our, in our narrative? Who's the, who's the archetypal opposite of the daughters of Tzolofachad? Who would that be? Korach, exactly. So Korach, basically, remember, he gathers a whole bunch of people ambushes Moses and Aaron, does not bring any substantive point. He doesn't say, you know that law, of the, he doesn't do that. He says, you're bad. You're basically power hungry. You shouldn't be in charge. He said, can you give me an example? Oh, we don't give examples, right? We just defame, attack, and want to undermine you. We don't care about examples, right? So the son, what happens to, the, to Korah? Well, they're put under the earth. Kind of telling us that's not the way to do it, you Korah people. Um, if you got something to say, you're going to actually change history, maybe Pinchas, but better off, the, our highest paradigm is the daughters of Tzolofachad. That is actually the way to do it. But look here, if you have your Bibles with you, go to the book of Numbers, chapter 26, verse 11, 394, 395. It's talking about all these different families, and it reminds us here. Uh, it says the sons of Eliab, Nuel, Datan, Abiram, the same Datan and Abiram who were summoned by the assembly contended against Moses and Aaron among the assembly of Korah when they contended against God. The earth opened its mouth and swallowed them and Korah with the death of the assembly when the fire consumed 250 men and they became a sign. However, the sons of Korah did not die. Now, why would the Bible take pains to tell us the sons of Korah did not die. From an archetypal perspective, it's as if the Torah is granting, but they had a point. Why would they have to tell us the sons of Korah didn't die? You might want to say, let's, let's extinguish the memory of Korah. By saying the sons of Korah didn't die, and there are actually psalms, psalms in the Bible from the sons of Korah. So the rabbis wonder, but if Korah was so bad, why are we, why does it tell us the sons of Korach didn't die? And why do the sons of Korach show up later? And why does Korach get psalms? Because they're saying, yes, he did it very, very badly. But he was on to something. And so what was Korach on to? 
Well, you might say something that Pinchas was onto, which is the law doesn't govern this situation. But if you think the, go- the law governs every situation, well, th- then, then you're, you just have limited consciousness. You're, you're a very low thinking human being. Law tries to address the human condition. It can't succeed. So sometimes doing something outside the law actually means, as Ishaya said, you're doing it in the spirit of the law. Because the spirit of the law, remember, is to reduce harm if we can and create goodness. And if what's happening here is going gonna, is gonna to great, cause great harm, somebody has to stop it, even if the law doesn't tell you this, because you might say that's the spirit of law. I would call it the natural law, which means the natural law embedded in the conscience of every human being, which is to do the good, do not do harm. And sometimes you have to do things that other people are not seeing. 